completely up to them. So for those people that you're referring to who get sidetracked or otherwise, my simple advice is, in my mind, this is one life. I'm not, we haven't spoken about religions, so I'm not sure if you're religious or not, and I mean no offence to anyone else, but it's my belief that we have one life. If we do have a secondary life, we're reincarnated, wow, I could come back as a one-legged seagull. <laughs> Understand. And I spend my entire life trying to eat a chip down at St Kilda Beach all day. Okay, not bad, I get to fly and all the rest of it. You know what, the odd chip's not a bad thing either, but it's not really the life that I want. So with that in mind, this one life needs to be the life that I want. And that means that you're going to have to invest, you're going to have to sacrifice, you're going to have to work hard towards the things that you genuinely aspire to. No one's going to give those to you. And if that means on a Saturday night that you want to drink 30 beers and drive your car home at 120 kilometres an hour and wrap it around a power pole and hurt yourself and some other people, well then that's the choice that you make. That's the door that you chose. Your parents, okay, they may or may not have included some sort of stimulus to either assist or decrease the chances of that happening, but ultimately it's your hand holding the beer, the steering wheel responsible for those actions. If you choose to hit the sack at 9.30, 10 o'clock and get up the next day and play sport, sport, what a wonderful pursuit, sport, not work in a ditch, not work in, under an office, but play sport in an aspirational sense to be a professional, then I suggest maybe you need to be pulling on the grass that's around you when you're stretching before training or, or looking up at the sky and realising, you know what, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. And that doesn't mean you have to be the world's greatest athlete, or you will be, it just means that when you're 35 or 45 or 55, 65, whenever it is that you've got the time to step back and genuinely know, you know what, it's over. Mm. I'm not gonna be in that space anymore. How did I go? You know what? <laughs> I gave it just about everything. To say you gave it everything, mm, might be a bit unrealistic, you know? Not everyone can get it 100% right. But to say you gave it just about everything you had, that's a pretty damn good result. And you think about the sacrifices that you made along the way, big or small, and that's all relative. Well, the end result is you got to play sport for a living or having said that we've just been sport centric you got to become a wonderful accountant or a wonderful artist or a doctor or a police officer or whatever it is that you want to do so as I said I think I base my life on that one life theory and I want to get the most I can out of it every single day will I make mistakes hell yeah I'm the king of making mistakes <laughs> no doubt I'll make mistakes I'll get things wrong but more often than not, I'm pushing forward. I might tread water for a moment, but I'm pushing forward towards the bigger goals that I'm looking to achieve. And that's gonna mean that sometimes there's a sacrifice, whatever it may be. Uh, some things you can compromise on, some things that you can't. But if you wanna be a, a top, top athlete globally, let alone Australia, getting back to your initial question, that's gonna take some real desire some real desire and I think that the really interesting thing about your question too and just having this technology around us now and so forth is to take it into an art space there was a time where you and I sitting in our lounge rooms at any point in time in, in terms of maybe even say mid 90s whatnot we could be forgiven for thinking that we were incredible artists and we're the only ones Imran's the only one who can draw something like Glenn's the only but the, 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 the real, I guess, surge of the internet and all sorts of websites, all of a sudden you realise there's a kid in Bangladesh who can do something incredible. There's a kid there in New Jersey. There's another person there in Mumbai. Wow, there's somebody in Ho Chi Minh City. Wow, there's all these people right across the globe who can do incredible stuff. There might only be one door. Which one of those people is going to choose to push through it? And if you just choose to sit there and wait, or as you alluded to, Imran, do something untoward to yourself or others, someone else pushes through your door. So I, no one pushes through my door. I've got one life to find as many great doors as I can. I want to keep targeting them and enjoying them and finding out what's on the other side. No, excellent comments. I would also like to add, like, from my personal point of view, life is short yeah. and it's very precious. Anything can happen to you. And what I don't like seeing is people only change their lives if something significant happens. For example, someone's told, 
you have cancer, you have two years to live. Then people do what they've always wanted to do because they, they have like a, a t like a deadline. I agree with you. 100. Whereas they shouldn't have to rely on something traumatic happening. They should, yeah, like you said, life is precious. You should make the most of it. Oh, that's my point of view. I don't like seeing, yeah, someone, something really bad happens to them. They're like, oh my God, I don't have much time. I better do something now. That should, Absolutely. That should happen from the beginning. And that's the funny thing about my personal story is that I always had that philosophy in life. It was when I became... Uh, obstructed mentally, if you will, by the goal of wanting to be a footballer sure. rather than playing football. I wanted to be a footballer. That's what skewed me out of that space because I grew up in a family where race, colour, creed, religion, socioeconomic status was never mentioned. I was always spoken to about people. So that was my background. I wanted to be around people. So it was funny that I became a person who did worry about all those things. Oh, you, you're not like me, you're not a footballer. So I hear what you're saying and uh, I was lucky that my uh, turning point was many moons ago and also not something as dramatic as, as a disease such as cancer and so forth. But I agree with you 100%. Why live a life that's anything less than you want it to be? And why does it take something tragic before you start living that life. So if anyone's watching this uh, particular program, I would really hope that they, again, maybe it's this program, is the catalyst to them saying, you know what, actually, I wanna live this way. I wanna do that. I wanna think this way. And as long as it's considered learned thought, well then I think it's fantastic. Be who you are. Excellent. Also, post your AFL career, you had a few stints in other sports. I, I did. You tried soccer as a goalkeeper. I did. And you also went to the Australian bobsleigh team. <laughs> yes, as you do. Well, that's, you, you know, yeah. whether you deliberately <laughs> segued into that or not, it's the perfect example. So during my final year of AFL football, I knew that I was over it. I knew that I didn't want to keep playing. Sure. I knew that I wanted to do something else in a sporting sense. And that's something that I'd always had up my sleeve that I wanted to do. There were lots of other different sporting opportunities for me, but the one that I chose was to play soccer. It was a wonderful decision in the sense that I've made some wonderful friends out of it in a relatively short period of time, and it is an incredible game. Yeah. Soccer is just an incredible sport, a very, very important sport uh, globally. Uh, but unfortunately, as people watching and or yourself will know, that uh, soccer was disbanded in Australia in roughly 2004, it went into a hiatus. So there was no A-League, uh, the NSL disbanded. So I was left without a sport and a choice, sit on the couch and eat a donut a day and watch my life just disappear into a basically anonymity uh, or maybe go and do some investigation and see what other opportunities lay before me. And one of them that was presented after I went and knocked on the door of the VIS, which anyone can do, was bobsledding. And at the time I'd never even seen snow before. So I said to myself, what better opportunity to see snow and to really get off the couch and do something different and push some boundaries and find out if I'm prepared to fail. Because the chances of me succeeding were very, very slim. Not a lot of snow around here in Melbourne. We've yeah. got a white background, but it's not snow. <laughs> yeah. So no real bobsled facility. Obviously at that stage, I was in my early 30s. Uh, what am I going to do in terms of knowledge with this sport and so forth? It, the odds were against me and the rest of the team. And as it turned out, we failed. We didn't make the Olympics in 2006, Torino, Italy. Uh, we were knocked out of qualification from memory, I think, by New Zealand. They had some very disciplined sheep. <laughs> so we missed out, yeah. but um, I really won. I won a lot. I won some tremendous friends, some friends that male and female that I absolutely adore. I won some amazing respect for myself, knowing how hard I worked and how hard I tried to perform in that space. I won some incredible stories. Oh wow, the stories I have. And the experience itself of being in Germany is a country that I absolutely can't get enough of. I think Germany is an amazing place. To have all of that on the back end of saying, you know what, I'll try that. Well, there's another one of those doors opening up. Didn't lead to a huge pot of gold, yeah. but it led to something else. And I'm oh, forever grateful for that experience. And quite truthfully, people ask me all the time, do you miss AFL football? Do you miss this? Do you miss that? Well, yes, I miss live television. I love live television. When I was part of the footy show regularly, I absolutely loved doing yeah, that. Yeah, sure. 
did I miss playing AFL football? Hell yeah. Well, who wouldn't miss standing in front of 50, 100,000 people? That's tremendous. And playing, uh, I was spoke about soccer earlier. Soccer's an amazing game. Basketball, amazing games. I think globally the two most important games. But in terms of the hardest game, the game that really asks the most of any athlete, in my opinion, you can't go past AFL football. Just an incredible sport, incredible game. And, Again, like to miss out on playing that, yeah, it's, it's tough. But to start every day, if I had the chance, with just one race of a ball, run of a bobsled, oh wow, what an incredible, exhilarating experience. Honestly, if I could get up every single morning, jump into a bobsled and hurdle down a mountain for no good reason, <laughs> I would love to do it because it is that much fun. It is incredible. You know something I've sensed from you, Glenn, since we started this interview? You're someone that you don't base reward on something monetary. So for example, I've asked a lot of people, do you recommend for someone to meet an interview? And they all, 99% of the time, I hear the answer, oh, I don't know anyone who's rich, and that infuriates me. Mm. I'm like, where did you get this perception mm. that someone is successful based on wealth? Yeah, absolutely. And from most of your answers, for example, just one you discovered the bobsleigh team, you didn't make the Olympics, but you made great friends, mm. you learned a lot about yourself. All non-monetary, so oh, soft skills, other things, which I think is an excellent example for people out there. Absolutely. Look, relationships are the number one commodity. And I'm rich in real relationships. I have a real relationship with myself, so I have a real knowledge of who I am. And I'm very, very wealthy in terms of having really strong friendships, real friendships with a diverse range of people. So I've got good friends who are 20 years younger than me, good friends who are 20 years older than me, male or female, different backgrounds. Some of them I see regularly, some of them I party with, some of them I cry with, some of them I train with, some of them I see once in a blue moon. But it's real. They're real friendships and we just pick up where we left off. And I respect them for all sorts of things within their lives and the people they are, but they have similar traits to mine. And so you look at it on paper and you say, well, Glenn's very different to Mary. Mm. But when you start going through the criteria of who each per person is, it meshes really well. So to think that I've got such people in my life is fantastic. And on top of that, living a life around these people leads to wonderful experiences. So relationships, experiences, now we're starting to really talk. Money, it's down here somewhere. Yes, you could argue that more money gives you better relationships and better experience, but does it really? I don't know. That's something for people to debate at home. I'm really comfortable placing it in that order. Money, as I said, might be fourth or fifth down the line. And money really, it's all, again, it's all relative. If you haven't got people to enjoy things with, what's the use of money? No, that's true. You can't buy you complete happiness. No, not at all. And again, you alluded to the fact of somebody suffering from something as uh, tragic and often terminal as cancer, well, you'd have all the money in the world then. It ain't gonna make a difference. Yeah. You know, Glenn, thank you so much for your Pleasure. time today. Pleasure. I've learned so much about myself as well. Yeah, cheers. Plus you. And let's keep in touch. I wish the best luck for all your endeavors. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I hope you continue to do these interviews because people such as yourself and the, the viewer may not know, this is self-funded and it's done with, uh, I think, a real passion for this space. It's not cheap to put this together when you have real lighting, a real cameraman, real sound, three cameras and a desire to share stories from people whom Imran has approached essentially cold. And I encourage other people who are watching who may be approached to put their time out to engage and share and partake in, I think, a really valuable interview. So thanks for having Thank me. Thank you, Glenn. I appreciate and it very Jerry much. Jerry out there, I didn't ask him to say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, he didn't, but he did pay me $100. Excellent. Thank you so Good much, Glenn. Glenn. Cheers. Thank you for watching another episode of The Voice Over Later. You would have noticed the jazz music in the background. That wasn't deliberate. It's just the studio we're in. But it did add a lot of emphasis, and I personally loved it. Thank you for watching this episode. Glenn very unique and inspirational character at the same time. Many sports players are perceived in a certain way because people see them you know, on the medium, on the field. And he's a classic example of someone 
when he's outside the field, you see the real him. And especially from where I was sitting, I could see a genuine part of him coming out, and it was brilliant. Thank you again for watching this episode. Remember, if you or someone you know is a high achieving leader and would like to have an interview with me, please visit my website, answer three questions, and send an email to thevoiceoverleader at gmail.com. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel and like my Facebook page. You are kept up to date with this series. Now, before I finish, just one final thing I want to add. As Glenn mentioned, be yourself and don't be quick to judge. Thank you once again. See you next time.